we have had three memorial lectures from Manikal by Kumar Shani, who is luckily here, the first one, then by Rashmi Dorai Swami, the third one was by Dilip Padgamkar, and today we have the fourth one by Gurvinder Singh. He is of course the youngest of the lot. As you see, his lecture is called Between the Two Wings, a reflection on comprehension and practice. So may I request Gurvinder Singh, would you speak from there or from there? Thank you Ashokji for giving me this opportunity and uh, I call this best lectures by even mostly by old people. <laughs> I am not an academic or a scholar who is comfortable with a desk, symposiums or lecture rooms. I'd rather be where you are right now and not behind this podium. Sometimes I find it, find it incapable to think in words or put ideas into words. Hence, when asked to give a lecture, I first confront my own limitations with the medium of words. Ideas or events need a structure to be espoused or made visible. My comfort space is the space of images and sounds, not words. And creating those images is perhaps a way of thinking I'm more comfortable and familiar with. It's the space I enjoy and travel in with a childlike enthusiasm. I had once asked Mani, forever intrigued, intrigued with his energy and desire to learn and express, how did he find it possible to go through the arduous process of making films after films? which he did with a relentless vigor, almost against all odds. Did not the process of shooting film after film exhaust him when he was making films with the regularity and intensity he was? I, of course, was trying to figure out the limitations of my own bodily slumber and whether I had it in me to go through this physically and mentally tasking process. Very calmly, he reflected on the question, as he always did, and said, he would sleepwalk through all those shoots. Sleepwalking, to be in the state of sleep and waking at the same time. I, recollect, I recollected the American composer John Cage's remark, being home is that feeling of oneness with oneself. That was what perhaps money meant, home being who you are or knowing who you are. Shooting meant for him being at home whether they were the ghats of Benares or a frozen lake in Ladakh, or be it Altamont Road or Versova in Bombay. I realized being at home was perhaps the only route for any artist, even so more for a filmmaker who has to confront the often hostile world of raising finance and engaging distribution. This hostility perhaps did not end with just that, and extended into the world of reception, replete with a lack of perception or sympathy towards certain forms of expressions not in sync with mass and mechanically produced forms. Did one want to go down that path? Did I want to go down that path? Was filmmaking at all a medium for me, for someone who felt inhibited to even share with others what he was practicing? Cinema started at an early age, unconsciously, and of which I have no record, only memory. And yes, it did start as a moving image, but without a movie camera. No longer in use, an old twin reflex camera light neglected around the house. Unlike today's digital cameras, it was an easy piece to fling open and look inside its innards, fingering and dissecting every part, the ground glass, the mirror, the lens, the plastic spool on which the film rotated. And when the camera was held close to a wall with its back open, it threw magical color images on the wall of what the lens was facing. Whereas all the pictures taken by it until then by my father were just monochromatic, deep blacks and pristine whites on bromide paper. What I now saw, saw were rich hues of greens of the eucalyptus trees outside, its branches swaying gently in the afternoon breeze in this tiny square image on the wall. It was a miracle to see the wide world outside encapsulated in this little square on the wall and all in color. And there it was forever, as long as you held the camera close to the wall. No pressing of any button or loading or developing any film. It didn't cost anything. 
You could point it in any direction and I have a condensed, crisp, clear image on the wall. If something moved in front of the lens, it moved in the image too. And if the lens was rotated, it threw the image into a blurry fuzziness, turning the real world into abstract patterns of colors. And rotated back, the abstraction miraculously returned to the recognizable world. It left me perplexed how a camera which only took frozen black and white images on paper could create these alive forms, both abstract and coherent, and that too in color. Now when I look back, I realize I was discovering the science behind the making of photographic images, my own camera obscura. But more importantly, in one stroke, wondering at the relationship between the real and the abstract, the formed and the formless, the reality and its perception. Did the human eye also see like the camera was seeing? The human eye had no clear edges, whereas photographs, paintings, cinema halls, television, all had clear edges where the image ended. Everything was confined in a rectangle or a square, seldom in an oval or a circle. Whereas what the eye saw faded into blurriness at the corners. But one could always move the eyeballs or turn the head into any direction to extend one's vision. The world of images was always cut off at the edges. Where to cut it off became the fundamental question and a singular obsession. I started scanning through magazines and newspapers and kept fervently cutting and collecting whatever caught my fancy. <clears throat> the printed world of images was more seductive than the real world one was growing up in. Reproductions of paintings, photographs, faces, advertisements, typo typography, all neatly tucked into notebooks or pasted on sheets of paper. Unrelated things all juxtaposed with no apparent connections between those images and words. And with no desire to arrive at a narrative or meaning, but still feeling a connection between those which I could not explain, but only feel. Feelings seemed more intoxicating than the rationality of meaning and explanation, which is what education and learning in curriculum was all about. Seeing through a camera's lens and gathering these unrelated images became an act of rebellion against the rigid and confined methodology of having to forcefully memorize things one was not interested in, but forced fed with. The classroom became a draconian space which left one famished and hungry for other experiences. Whereas there was a freedom in looking, hearing, observing, feeling, capturing, expressing, wandering in aimless pursuits, <clears throat> and tracing outlines of contours of an old man with deep melancholic eyes, which many years later I realized was the self-portrait of the artist Rembrandt. I would often be so moved by a film or feel so agonized and restless about the state of human existence as depicted, but if someone were to ask me the story of the film, I won't be able to describe anything because I had never cared to follow it. Concept, ideas, theories, I would view with suspicion. Plots, situations, psychological impulses discussed in classroom made me wary. That could not be the reason why a film would be made. The burden of meaning seemed to distill what was mysterious and magical about those films, reducing it to explanatory notes. The unfathomable fathomable had a depth in which I also seemed to be swimming rather than simply understanding. And that seemed to be the only valid experience one could gather from a film. The streets of Pune offered an escape from the onus of expectations and the daily confrontations with virtuos virtuosos of cinematic history. To lose oneself in one's own backyard was perhaps as important as navigating the streets of Tokyo or Paris. I locked myself up all night in the dark room of the Institute, immersed in the smell of photochemicals and film and the magical transformation of a white sheet into rich tones of blacks and grays. Gone was the wall that did not record anything. The feeling of ephemerality and loss gave way to a sense of empowerment and possession. The images stayed and were recorded, literally fixed by a chemical. As Susan Sontag wrote in her seminal essay on photography, to photograph is to appropriate the thing photographed. It means putting oneself into a certain relation to the world that feels like knowledge and therefore 
like power. One felt one was in possession of this external reality, captured through a lens for a fragment of a second. But did it add up to something significant in terms of experience or understanding of events and emotions? What was amiss that one wondered so much about after watching, say, a film by Andrei Tarkovsky or Yasujiro Ozu or Robert Bresson? Susan Sontag further goes to add, photographed images do not seem to be statements about the world so much as pieces of it, miniatures of reality that anyone can make or acquire. She says, a photograph is both a pseudo-presence and a token of absence. If a photograph was a pseudo-presence, then what was cinema? And what went absent from this presence of a split moment on paper? All the nights dodging and burning images onto bromide paper and dipping fingers into photochemicals instead of solving anything, only complicated things. Beautiful compositions and striking visual forms started seeming restricting. How long could one look at a distinctive face or admire the frozen blades of grass rendered as authentically as possible in its tonalities? Picasso's broken and fragmented forms and even Matisse's childlike paper cuts seemed more arresting and mysterious. I felt cinema was as simple as joining moving photographs, if one could call the unit of shot as a moving photograph. At that time, it did seem that simple. At that time, it did seem that simple, as if all one needed was an arresting frame after another. The complex polyphony of images, sounds and words, was not as easy as putting together a few scraps of images and letting them be. To quote Susan Sontag again, the camera's rendering of reality must always hide more than it discloses. In contrast to the amorous relation, which is based on how something looks, understanding is based on how it functions. And functioning takes place in time and must be explained in time. Only that which narrates can make us understand. What primarily Hockney was doing was extending space with movement and bringing in the dimension of time and memory into those joiners. The camera is quite a lot older than photography, and it has dominated Western art for about 400 years since the invention of the camera obscura. Many artists like Canaletto and Vermeer used the camera obscura, and naturally they were fascinated by its possibilities. With the invention of the camera obscura, easel painting flourished. Previously, the idea of painting was always on much bigger areas, such as walls or ceilings, and the edges were far away. Painting was not about edges and corners. But with this idea of the window, the camera leads inevitably to an interest in verisimilitude. By the 19th century, a lot of artists realized there was something wrong with this. It was not quite truthful. And in Europe, certain artists noticed, <clears throat> certain artists started to escape from the one point perspective of Western art when they noticed Oriental art and Japanese art in particular. The Japanese and the Chinese did not have the camera until the 19th century. One assumes they didn't because there's no evidence of their art being one eyed. Renaissance artists were always looking with one eye, looking through a hole. Oriental artists had different ideas. They could depict a landscape as a scroll which opens out. While a Chinese artist would paint his experience of the walk in the garden, the Western artist became content with looking at the garden through the window. His experience became stationary. Manet and Van Gogh saw some Japanese prints which must have looked unbelievable to them in the 19th century. Here was an art that dealt with essences, not with verisimilitude, which is about surfaces. They were fascinated at influence, and it influenced them. Manet's forms became simpler and bolder. They accused of Manet of being like a child, which is just what they called Picasso. Hockney says, 
I realized that with this photography, that is of his joiners, I was making things closer to the truth of the way we see them. We see everything in focus, but we don't see it all at once. We take time. I could not but think back to the murals of Ajanta, of a free-flowing art, creating narrative, dialogue, dimensions in space and time, or of Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, and the scroll painters of Orissa, Bengal, and Rajasthan, who know no edges. If a conventional Western perspective freezes the moment, it must surely stop the flow of time. The trouble with perspective is that it has no movement at all. The one vanishing point exists only for a fresh fraction of seconds to us. The moment your eye moves, it's gone, and it's somewhere else. In a painting, the hand is moving. The mark is being made. These things themselves run through time. It's an interesting fact that the perspective in painting matters less than it does in the photograph, which by nature of the lens is forced to have perspective. The Renaissance idea of fixing space persists. Posing for a photograph is a Renaissance idea. When you pose for a photograph, you stop, and you imitate the stop time. One day I received an email from Ani. And this was the year 2005. He had decided to go to the Film Institute in Pune to conduct a workshop. He asked if I would be his teaching assistant. Of course, I didn't have to blink an eye before deciding. And I know that at the pretext of the post of a teaching assistant, Mani was inviting me to be his student. Unlike other filmmaker teacher, teachers, Mani would never talk about his films. If asked a question about his work in the class, he would deflect it to a larger philosophical question about space, movement, representation, nature of things, memory, and more significantly, towards duration, attention, and time. Space was negotiable. A lot of us understood the implications of moving in space, but we grappled with the movement in time. For the first time, while discussing filmmaking, things moved away from visual, visual representation to unfolding of time as a central idea, the very, the very material of filmmaking. As Godard said, Modernity being a tendency to reduce everything to the present, to the observable and reproducible, to what appears in front of or is determined by the camera, and modern art by contrast, embodying resistance to this reductive tendency by attempting to liberate its utopian virtualities, cinema, situated at the meeting point of these two possibilities, ought to be the most important thing in contemporary art. Money had this unique ability to clarify things one was grappling with, with a small answer, never more than four or five words. I mean, money is known to give long lectures, but when it came to clarifying what one was grappling with, you never received a lecture, you only <laughs> got a small capsule. <laughs> We all knew of the visual impact of his films and the often impressive cinematography. Restless and having grappled with and sometimes failed with striking visual compositions, which I knew came very easily and confidently to me, I wished to know how he composed his shots. So I asked Mani, Mani, how do you decide how to compose? He reflected over the course of a few seconds and then said, I compose for light. Light. And then I wondered, how come one has never thought of light while composing? <laughs> Why has it always been about lines and perspective and shapes and volumes and planes? That small answer fundamentally changed my way of looking through the camera. How light fell on objects and people and spaces became the overriding concern. Suddenly, composition became the least important thing to worry about. I became aware that attention was drawn by the quality of light in which composition had a very small role to play. 
and that attention created a certain feeling and emotion in the shot. And that feeling and emotion gave a direct ex experience of passage of time, of life in itself. As Kandinsky remarked about Cezanne, Cezanne made a living thing out of a teacup, or rather in a teacup he realized the existence of something alive. He raised still life to such a point that it ceased to be inanimate. He painted these things as he painted human beings because he was endowed with the gift of divining the inner life in everything. The light, I realized, was the inner life of things, the divine being. The other significant realization that made possible an affirmation of time concerned sound, which knew no edges or borders of the frame. The sound extended beyond the camera's eye, beyond the confines of the rectangle on the screen, like the mural or scroll artist extended their narrative beyond the periphery into a continuous and stretched idea of space and time. The less I relied on images for information and the more that role was taken over by sound, the images started becoming more robust and animated, bereft of the necessary desire to legislate. The images had to be stripped of the burden to carry the meaning so they could express freely. That burden had to be relayed to sound, which was a better carrier of all things associated and remembered. And it created the world around, extended into the echo of depths which no visual image could reach. The visual had lost another of its functions. It became, as e it became at ease with itself and could breathe. As Robert Bresson remarked, like an athlete passing on the baton in a relay. Those few days spent in Pune with him were so instrumental in, and consciously or subconsciously discarding notions and conventions that one banded around like excess, excess baggage on a flight. My thoughts go back to 2010 as another period of dismay with the expectations of the medium of cinema cast dark clouds over one's impulse. When the seven minutes of the opening sequence ended, he exclaimed, wow. He said it's very moving and musical but only one sound seemed out of rhythm for him. He said we should remove that dialogue and not worry about the visual cut or about the story. <laughs> if the cut was right, the image would find its own correct, if the sound cut was right, the image would find its own correct place and relationship in respect to other images. Here was a man who was challenging the very notion and convention of a visual cut, even as he breathed his last. At this stage, I would like to recall Kandinsky, who in his book, Concerning the Spiritual in Art, wrote, the artist must be blind to distinctions between recognized or unrecognized conventions of form, deaf to the transitory teaching and demands of his particular age. He must watch only the trend of the inner need and hearken to its words alone. Then he will with safety employ means both sanctioned and forbidden by his contemporaries. All means are sacred, which are called for by the inner need. All means are sinful, which obscure that inner need. After those last few days spent with him, as I left with a heavy heart, knowing perhaps it was the final adieu, I received an email a few days later. Money had written, I do hope your editor is doing a blind sound cut and not compromising the rhythm of the soundtrack by each time checking the visual result. That is, looking at the image track and attempting a balance between image and sound. Once the image gets into the so-called correct action cut mold, the cinematograph is finished. At least, a direct expression of time is dead. In the realm of, in the realm of employing time as a cinematographic tool, the space must freely become what it will. Time is no longer enslaved by spatial conventions of creating physical significances. Space is devoted to cause and effect paradigm. Time is free of it because it is carried by no cause and effect agency. One reason why we continue to hopelessly imagine that cause and effect will save us. The truth is that quite unexpectedly, Time takes or does not take its toll. It saves when things point to an end, 
it destroys when things appear imperishable. Welcome to It's My Life, the program that brings you Facebook.